All right. Make myself presenter here. Here we go. All right. Well, uh, we are going to have a lot of fun stuff to show today. Um, I, I'm going to start this way, though. Many of you, especially looking at that poll, was interesting. So, so more than half of you, I think, I think it was more than half. It was like 58%. This is the first time you've ever seen Power Apps. And so you might be asking, you know, why is Pragmatic Works showing Power Apps webinars? And, uh, you know, Power Apps, if you're not really familiar with it, is tied in a little bit with Power BI in that it's part of the same kind of ecosystem to some extent. It's part of the Power Platform. Uh, Power Platform includes three tools, Power BI, Power Apps, and Microsoft Flow. And there's a lot of integration here. And um, as you can see on my screen, hopefully you're able to see my screen, Crystal. Are you seeing it okay? Yeah, I can see you perfectly. Okay, perfect. So part of the reason why we're showing you this is we're actually launching a couple new courses. Uh, we're going to have a new introduction to Power Apps course, which is obviously going to go much deeper than I can in one hour here today. Uh, we're then going to release a few weeks later. We, By the way, we've already recorded the first one. That one should be out, I'm hoping, in the next two weeks. Uh, we're going through edits on it now. Um, and then next month, maybe towards the later part of the next month, we're going to be launching another Power Apps course that's going to be Power Apps and with Microsoft Flow. So you'll get a picture of how these two tools integrate together, and you'll also see some integration in that second course with Power BI as well. So how does Power BI integrate with Power Apps? There's some really cool capabilities uh, that these things do to tie together. And as part of that, I wanted to give you guys a special offer. Uh, we actually, for you attending the webinar today, you can purchase our on-demand training elite package for $500 off. So that's the largest discount we give usually, uh, unless you're buying a bunch. Uh, but you can go to our website if you're interested. So these, these two courses that I'm mentioning right now, Introduction to Power Apps and Advanced Power Apps, will be in our package that we have later. So if you purchase now, you'll be able to see those added to your course list uh, in the next few weeks as we add them. Uh, a couple other things. We're also going to be doing a Power Apps workshop. So if one hour is not enough for you, we're also going to be doing a four-hour uh, workshop uh, later this year, so November 1st. Uh, here's the topics you can see that are going to be going into it. This is actually the same topics that we're going to have in our on-demand training, but we're going to be doing them uh, in a live taught session as well. So if you're interested in that, we just launched the Power Apps workshop that will be November 1st. It's a virtual event you can attend, and it's a low price. It's 95 bucks, or if you are one of our on-demand training elite members already, then you can attend for free. And you can uh, let me know if you'd like to attend that. Many of you that have done that before already know who to contact to make sure that you are able to attend. Uh, one last thing, I, uh, announcement. Uh, well, you can see we're making some pretty big investments here in Power Apps at Pragmatic Works. One last announcement is we're, we're doing this thing called App a Day, kind of like Apple a Day, but App a Day. Uh, and we're going to be doing a new Power App challenge each day. And this will be in the month of September. And we're looking for ideas from you on the kind of things that you would be interested in seeing. Uh, so if you can, email training at pragmaticworks.com as you start to look at Power Apps and think about things that are interesting in Power Apps. And what are some challenges that you'd like to see? Email me. Email me at training at pragmaticworks.com. And we're going to have a day, at least for a month, a daily video series uh, that shows you different things you can do with Power Apps. I think you guys are really enjoy what it's what's possible with it as we uh, get a preview of it today. All right, enough of those announcements. So <laughs> our focus for today really is to show you what Power Apps can do. I do have some slides up front, but then we're going to jump into some demonstrations to show you what Power Apps uh, is possible, what it can do. And I'm seeing a bunch of uh, people say they're they're not having audio. Crystal, you're still good with audio? Could be just them. You good, Crystal? Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. <laughs> All right. So uh, what we're going to jump into here is giving you a good picture of what this tool can do. And so a couple things that we're going to tackle in this one-hour session that we have today are uh, an overview of what the tool is. So for many of you, this is the first time you've ever seen it. So I want to give you a little bit of overview of what it is. We're going to walk you through how you can build a basic application using Power Apps. And then we're going to walk you through how you can then customize that app. Okay. Uh, the first thing that we're going to end up doing, though, is we're going to show you how you can actually leverage and use the templates that are available and using those templates, how you can then customize them. So there's some really cool things you're going to see, I hope, today. And we got a lot to cover, so I'm going to jump right into it. So if you're not really familiar with what the purpose of Power Apps is, I want to start with that. The purpose of Power Apps is to give you the ability... And when I say you, yes, I mean you. Even if you're not necessarily a .NET developer, you can develop apps in Power Apps. 
And the goal with it is to be able to build line of business applications. So applications that can be used within your business to be able to solve problems. So it could be you know, different applications that your customers need to cut, touch. It could be line of business applications that serve a particular need like processing customer transactions or integrating multiple systems together in some way. And it's really trying to solve those problems of being able to create these applications that integrate with your various data sources really quickly and really easily and be able to write data back to those data sources as well. So it's, it's built to specifically serve those different organizational needs that you have, these, these business problems that you have, these little applications that need to be designed. It's helping you solve some of those problems. And it's also making it so that you, as in, in some cases, it may depend on who you are, it allows the end user or a power user to actually be able to develop these applications themselves. And it kind of, it really brings to life this term of a citizen developer, a developer that is maybe not someone that has .NET capabilities or Java capabilities, but knows how to work with Excel really well. And if you know how to work with Excel really well, then you are ready to work with Power Apps. So if you feel like you're pretty competent in Excel, Power Apps is something that you're able to do now. Uh, what you're going to see is I kind of I kind of usually talk about it like this. Power Apps, when you look at it at first, kind of feels like a combination of PowerPoint and Excel pushed together because there's going to be some elements that look like PowerPoint where you can drag elements onto the design surface. And then the Excel part is where you can kind of configure what those uh, different controls are doing through the formula bar. Uh, so it's solving that problem of making it where anybody can really develop applications. And it's also solving the, the, the problem of not really having very many mobile friendly capabilities or mobile friendly apps, I should say. So a lot of times when you have developers develop applications for you, they're developing, developing them from a web browser or for your desktop. And it makes it where, you know, in, a, in the kind of life that we live today where we're constantly on the go, you don't have as e easy accessibility to those applications. And with Power Apps, what changes that is you now have the ability to easily get to your applications through the Power Apps mobile application. So on your iPhone, Windows, Android devices, you have a Power Apps app that's already been approved in the store. You download the Power Apps app, and then you can easily get to the applications that you've developed from that app. And you can even pin those applications to your home screen so you can easily get to them. So it makes uh, what would normally be a very difficult thing to make mobile applications actually pretty easy. And so part of the thing that, and I'm going to be pretty brief on this screen, but part of what really brings many people to the, the decision point to, to decide to use Power Apps is they're trying to decide whether or not they should build these applications with their .NET team. You know, they have these Java developers and .NET developers that, that can spend months and months and months developing something. Uh, or they can go buy something off the shelf that could potentially solve the problem. But usually when you buy something on the shelf, it doesn't solve all the problems that you have or you discover new problems after you buy it. Or if you build a custom application, that's going to take an enormous amount of time to do. Uh, and who's going to maintain it long term are some of the difficult things to, to determine. And so really what Power Apps is doing is solving both of these problems and that you can develop things very quickly in Power Apps and you can maintain it yourself long term. It's actually a very easy application to work with for developing other applications. And so it's a nice way to do that. And you'll see that as we get into our demonstration here. Now I mentioned the Microsoft Power Platform. It is part of the Microsoft Power Platform. So Power Apps, Microsoft Flow, and Power BI are all part of that ecosystem. And they uh, very much do, do work together. The tool sets that you have, uh, all three of these have intermingling parts that can connect to each other. You can actually have an application that you develop that writes to a database, then Power BI reads from that database, or vice versa. You can have a Power App that displays a tile from a Power BI dashboard. And then you can also use Microsoft Flow to have kind of a, an approval process. Let's say that you submit a time off request and you want someone to be able to approve that, you can do that through Power Apps, okay? So again, what is Power Apps? It is a fully uh, web-based cloud uh, rapid application development platform. So it's very easy to develop. It's all cloud-based. There actually used to be a desktop version of the tool uh, that's called uh, Power App Studio. Uh, that's all been moved to the web browser now. So all development is done from the web browser and then it can be viewed from either your web browser or from your mobile device. And it really creates this new culture of citizen developers. And these apps can easily be shared across your organization. Now, one thing I'll say that is uh, a huge feature request right now is they, they can only be shared within your organization. So keep that in mind. That's a big sticking point for a few people right now, obviously. 
Um, but if those of you that are on the call have played around with Power BI, you know that used to be a limitation of Power BI, but that's been overcome in Power BI. So I would expect some of those features that have been implemented in Power BI to come into Power Apps eventually. All right, so the kind of think about the kind of things that you would need to develop apps for. Really, this is my my rule of thumb. When you're thinking of Power Apps, if there's something that you're doing on paper right now, consider whether or not it can be done in a Power App. So things like performance reviews, maybe you're kind of doing on paper performance reviews right now, or maybe you need to connect to various data sources or just have a some kind of form that you can fill out. Or maybe you want an application that can actually leverage the things that are on your mobile device. I told you it's very mobile friendly. So you can use your mobile device and actually take advantage of things like the camera or the GPS or the microphone on your mobile device and have those things be inputted into Power Apps. Power Apps can leverage all those capabilities of your phone. It can even call existing APIs. So if there's APIs or different data sources that you need to connect to, you can pull in from those APIs the data and actually use it with inside of Power Apps. It's a really, really powerful tool when it comes to that. Now, the things that you'll be using, there's a couple different uh, uh, components of Power Apps here you should be aware of. There's the web.powerapps.com. Web.powerapps.com is where you'll kind of manage and share applications, so I'm starting in the middle there. There's create.powerapps.com, which you can easily get to from web.powerapps.com. That's where you can actually develop and design uh, solutions within Power Apps using Power App Studio. And then you can run those applications from either the web browser or Power Apps itself. Now, I'm not going to get super deep into licensing. I do have a slide here on licensing, and this is, of course, recorded, so you can come visit this later and get a, a deeper view at it. I just don't need to have enough time to go deep into this slide. But just note, if you're an Office 365 user, then you already have capabilities of working with Power Apps. Now, it's not a full license of Power Apps. There's some things that you'll be a little bit limited with. But if you are an Office 365 user, you can do Power Apps. If you're a Dynamics 365 user, you can also do Power Apps. If uh, you see that there's some features that you really want to have capability into, things like the Common Data Service, we're not going to talk about a ton about that today, uh, but Common Data Service for apps, then you may need to consider doing something like a Power Apps Plan 1 or Power Apps Plan 2. And you can certainly dig more into that on your own time. I really want to get into here quickly how to actually do some development. So when you're ready to get started with Power Apps, you can certainly go just like you can to Power BI, to go to powerbi.com. With Power Apps, you can go to powerapps.com. And you can sign up for a free trial if you'd like, or you can also sign up for a free Power Apps community plan license. And the community plan is very close to full featured. Uh, you can do things like the common data service in it. You can't do model-driven apps, which are another way of developing apps. Um, so there's some different things that you may or may not be able to do with the community plan, but the community plan is pretty good, and it's a good place to, good way to sign up and learn about how to use Power Apps for free. So do a quick Bing or Google search for Power Apps community plan, and you'll be able to sign up for a free account that uh, gives you everything you need to get started with Power Apps. Now, again, I mentioned this a couple times, the web-based IDE, the development environment that we're going to be using for Power Apps is called Power Apps Studio, and you'll see that here in a few moments. You may notice, or you may have noticed, that Power Apps actually has a uh, Windows 10 or Windows 8 app that you can download for your desktop. However, the capabilities of the desktop application have been removed, and anytime you try and do something in the desktop version of the app, it actually redirects you to the web browser. So just keep that in mind. All right, so let's actually go ahead and just kind of walk you through here how to get started with uh, getting signed up. And then I want to talk a little bit more on the slides, and then I have quite a bit of demo for you. So don't worry, you will see a lot of the tool today. All right, so let me bring over a web browser. And we're going to go to powerapps.com. Okay, so when you go to powerapps.com, you can, of course, sign up. So you can sign up for a free trial. Or, again, like I mentioned a few moments ago, you can also search for Power Apps Community Plan. And you can sign up for a community plan that's free. It's another way to get started. It's a great way to learn how to do Power Apps. Uh, that's actually their whole purpose of having this community plan. And when you sign up for this, you need to sign up for it either with a work or school account. Okay, so you need to use a work email address. You can't use a Gmail or a Hotmail. Uh, but once you do, you can then actually uh, start developing some applications. So you can either do the community plan or you can do the trial, which is going to be a fully featured plan. So there's a, again, I mentioned there's a few things missing, like model-driven apps from the community plan, whereas if you do the trial, it's a full featured trial. Or for many of you, you're already Office 365 users, and you just simply need to sign in. So I can click sign in here. 
And because I'm already an Office 365 user, it's actually here signed me in automatically, but it would have normally have prompted me to sign in. In my case, I'm already already in here, and you can see there's several applications I've already developed in here. For those of you that are board game players, there's one of my colleagues here developed an app for a board game called Ticket to Ride, and I have a bunch of other apps here. We'll take a look at a few of them as we get going. But your first starting point here, for many of you, I would suggest, is to take a look at the different uh, templates that are made available to you. So templates are a great way to get started with how Power Apps works and learning how Power Apps works. And I'm kind of scrolling down here and you're seeing all these different templates of different applications that are available for you that you can start to use and, and leverage. Uh, it's a great way to learn. It's a great way to get ideas of your own. So if you're trying to get ideas of kind of applications you might be able to use, then you can certainly uh, test these different themes out to see which one, or these templates, not themes, these different templates to see how you might be able to develop certain things. So this one's for booking a room. So if you want to reserve a room, for example, you might uh, develop or use this book a room template, and you can use the template and actually make it your own. I'm going to show you this one here. This is a help desk app. And if I want to use and leverage this template, I just select make it make this app. And when I do, it's going to actually build the app for me right now. So what you're about to see here is it's going to go from a template to actually an app that I can work with and play around with rather quickly. And I'll kind of walk you through the interface a little bit. And then what we're going to do after that is actually develop an app from scratch, or at least from a data set that we're going to create together. All right, so we give this a few moments here. Once it has completed, it is actually already done. Once it's completed, we can actually see the app that we have turned on. Uh, so let me actually walk you through what the app looks like, and then I'll walk you through this interface a little bit. I told you it looks a lot like PowerPoint. Check this out. On the left-hand side, almost like PowerPoint slides over here. So you can kind of scroll through the different slides or screens they're called here, or you can go to more of a tree view where you can see all the different little elements that are part of the screens that you've created, and you can kind of toggle back and forth between all the screens that are inside of your application. So you have two different views, more of a tree view, or you have a thumbnail view, which is more of that kind of PowerPoint view. I said it's also a little bit like Excel, and you can see that up top here. You have a formula bar, and inside the formula bar, you can configure the different controls that you put on your screen. So this control here, for example, has a formula. And if you look at that formula, it's not anything like Java. It's actually very similar to an Excel formula. You have a kind of a standard if statement here where I'm saying if, this per if, if my email address, the person that just logged in, if my email address is in this list called admin list, then I am an admin, and I'm allowed to click on this button, or I'm allowed to go further in this button. If I'm not, then I'm not allowed to click on that button. So there's some there's some things that you'll see as you look at the tool that are very, very similar to Excel. Some things are very similar to PowerPoint, but uh, you, that, that Excel background that you have will likely make things a lot easier for you. All right, so if I want to interact with this app, I can click the little play or preview button up in the top right-hand corner up here. Oh, sorry, I just shifted screens there. If I hit the little play button right here, this will launch the app for me, and I can test it out. and try it out. So I can say I want to log in as a help desk user. I want to add a help desk ticket here by hitting the little plus icon. And I can give the, t the ticket a name. I can say uh, uh, screen fuzzy. Not fussy, fuzzy. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a laptop issue, but I could change it to something else here. The priority is probably say high priority. And I can say my screen is difficult to read. Hit create, and it's now created this help desk ticket. And I can see that help desk ticket in here. If I wanted to, I can log out, leave this screen. It takes me back to where I was. If I click log back in, I can see the ticket that I had here is kind of waiting. It's not started. And I'm, it's basically waiting for an admin to come in and take care of it. Now, for me, I'm not an admin, but if I attempted to log in here as an admin, it would actually tell me we are unable to give you access because you're not an admin. So all this has actually been developed in the app itself. And there's a few things if I really want to take a look at it, I could trick this to, to tell it that I am an admin, just so we can take a look at what something like this application looks like. So I'm going to try and do a little trick here and say, uh, if Devin Knight, or my email address, logs in, then I'm allowed to go to that button. So by making that little change in the formula, I can now click on this login as a help desk admin, and I can see all the other screens that are available to an admin user. So I can see there's a bunch of other tickets that have already been submitted that are for other users, and I can go in and I can actually edit a ticket like this one here, and I can say that uh, it's in progress, it's about 11% in, I can assign it to a user, so maybe I assign this one to Mitchell Pearson, like so. 
and then I can hit update to actually update that ticket and for my user they will now be able to see that change to it so they can see for their one individual ticket that it's in progress it's been assigned to someone and so I know that I'm making progress on it so the idea here is this is just in one example of an app that you can develop this is based off of a template I can make this template my own if I wanted to by going underneath the file menu up in the top left if I go to file and hit save I can actually save this example to my environment okay so those of you that come from a Power BI background, you probably, you, you're probably familiar with the term work, workspaces, right? Workspaces are these different environments that you create here to be able to organize the apps that are the Power BI solutions that you develop. When it comes to Power Apps, you use and leverage something called environments. And you can see in the top right here, I have a couple environments that I'm assigned to that I can go back and look at when I'm on the other screen. But environments are basically the way that you can move applications from, let's say, for example, a dev test to production. So you can have a development environment, move it to a test environment, and then finally send it off to a production environment. If I hit save, it's going to prompt me and say uh, that, do I want to make this app my own? And it's going to prompt me to actually save the data for this app to some location. Okay, So it should actually prompt me at some point uh, to decide where to save that data, unless this template that I happen to pick actually saves it all internally to the app. So you do have some control over where the data itself is stored. You can actually go modify that if you want to. So if I were to go back here for a moment, I can actually go look underneath the view section, underneath data sources, and I can see that this is actually storing this information. It looks like it's actually storing it into uh, Office 365 in this case. So there's a, only one data source here, which is Office 365. So it's storing it somewhere within Office 365. I'm creating a bunch of tickets here. So kind of interesting. Now, the templates are great. The templates are a great way to start, but let's say that you wanted to create an application from scratch. Let's say you have some data somewhere, okay? Uh, there's, by the way, about 200 different data sources that you can connect to inside Power Apps. So you have a lot of data sources here, even more than, than that are available in Power BI. And you can use those different data sources to be able to pull in data, pull in from multiple sources, and use Power Apps as this way to actually write data back to those sources or to just consume data from those sources. Now, in my example here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this a very simple example So, because I want you to be able to follow along. I want you to at least be able to have a chance, if you watch this recording later, to follow along with my example. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to OneDrive for Business, and I'm going to create a new Excel workbook. Because I want to show you a very simple way of how you can do this on your own. You can certainly connect to SQL Server. You can connect to SQL Server either on-premises or in the cloud. Uh, if you connect to SQL Server on-premises, then you do need to use a data gateway, very similar to Power BI, if you're familiar with that already. Uh, but in my case, I'm actually going to be using a cloud source of OneDrive for Business. And so I'm going to create a couple columns here. And I'm going to show you actually something on purpose wrong, just so, so you can kind of get an idea of a usability thing that can be made easier. Notice here that I'm naming this one kind of camel casing here, first name with it all as one word, and I have this one as last name with a space in it. Uh, I usually recommend, especially when it comes to Power Apps, that you do not put spaces in your column names. You can add the spaces later, but if you add a space in the data source itself, it causes a few issues, uh, one issue in particular that I'll show you in a, a bit. So I'm going to purposely leave that with a space. Um, then uh, what I'm doing for this app that we're going to develop, I'm going to create basically this, this on-the-go veterinarian. So a, a veterinarian that can actually come to you. Rather than you taking your pet to the vet, the vet comes to you. Okay, And this vet deals with all sorts of animals. So big animals, small animals, all sorts of stuff. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a data source that basically stores all the veterinarian's appointments. So I want to be able to track the name of the customer. So I have the first and last name of the customer. I want the name of the pet or animal. Let's just call it animal name. We'll call it pet. That's fine. Pet name. Okay. We'll then uh, the name, give it a type of animal. So what's the animal type? And again, I'm going to leave no spaces. And then we'll also, let's put in here maybe what the procedure is that we're doing. Try and spell it right. And how about the date that it that the appointment is and the cost? Now I could get a little bit more fancy and put in the address and actually add some map, mapping capabilities in here. That's a little bit more advanced than what we're going to do today, but we're going to uh, make this one pretty simple. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do what I'm going to do is add in some data now. So I'll add in a user or a customer. So I'll make myself a customer, and I'll uh, add in a pet name called Sammy with an I and we'll make this my favorite kind of dog Weimariner 
Not sure how many of you are big fans of that kind of pet. It's a tough one to spell, though. There we go. And I'm going to say that this is its annual visit. Okay. The date I'm going to make is today. Okay. And I'm going to actually change the date to make it a date time. So I'm going to reformat this a little bit, mainly so we can come back and see it later in the Excel spreadsheet. But I'm going to change the format here so it is a date plus time. So we'll go with something that looks like this. Okay. And let's not make it 12 a.m. Let's make it something like 9 a.m. All right. And then we'll make the cost something like uh, $89.99. All right, so I have one row in here. Now, whenever you're doing this kind of test here, I always recommend uh, actually testing out with one row. So put one row of data inside of your data source, uh, especially when you're doing something like this before you go to you know load a ton in here or before you go just to uh, jump into Power Apps. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select the cells that I have here because when you wanna connect to and use this in Power Apps, the data must be in an Excel table. So right now it's just in a spreadsheet, but to add it into a table, I'll go into Insert, and insert it into a table here. My table does have headers, so I'll go ahead and hit OK on that. All right, so I'm doing this all from OneDrive for Business, uh, not all interactively here, nothing done inside of the Excel tool itself. This is all from a web browser. I'm also going to name the workbook that we're on here, so I'll go ahead and rename this. I'll call this Vet on the Go, something like that. And now we pretty much have our data source set. So I've got a row of data in here. I am actually ready where I can actually start to build something inside of Power Apps. Now, one other thing that you could do that would make life a little easier for yourself later is if you actually name the table itself. So you probably, if you've worked with Excel a lot, you probably know that uh, the tables that you create actually have names as well. I'm trying to peek here to see where to do it in uh, Excel online, but I'm not seeing it, so that's fine. Uh, but what you'll see is whenever I go to connect to this inside of Power Apps that if I haven't given the table a name, it's just going to call it Table 1. So just be uh, cautious of that as you see it whenever we get into Power Apps. All right, so with this done, I'm actually going to go ahead and close this out. And I can see in my OneDrive account, if I were to launch that, launch that one more time, I want to have that open because we're going to come back to look at this in a bit. But inside my OneDrive account, we should see that spreadsheet or that workbook ready to go. And the reason I want to open it back up here is just because I want to go back to show you what things look like in it as we start to add data. Okay, so I can see my vet on the go. Here's my, my, my sample I did earlier. But vet on the go is the one that we're going to work with. All right, so with that done, I'm going to go back over to powerapps.com. So I'm going to close a few of these things out so I can show you really slower how to create an app from scratch. And so the, where I'm at right now is web.powerapps.com. And this is the same screen that you'll see anytime after you log in. So after I go to powerapps.com, I log in or sign in. The first thing it's going to take me to is web.powerapps.com. This is where you can either create apps, manage apps, do whatever you need to do with administration of apps. There's an admin center that you can go to as well. There's a little bit more advanced administration capabilities you can do. This is also where you can share apps with others if you wanted to. But there's a lot of fun stuff that you can do within here. All right, now. If I want to create an app from scratch, I would go on the left-hand side here on the navigation, and I would select apps. And from here, you can see there's a bunch of apps that I've already created, a few apps that people have shared with me. But in my case, I actually want to create an app from scratch. So I'll select create an app. Now, when I do this, it's going to launch create.powerapps.com, just so you can kind of see the difference in the web browsers there. And from here, I can decide, what, where's my data at? How do I want to build this app? Do I want to build an app from a blank design surface, which is a little bit more difficult? There's just more time consuming, more things you have to drag in. Do I want to create an app from a template, which we already saw? Or do I want to create an app from these various data sources? And you can see there are a ton of data sources you can choose from. If you hit New Connection here, look at all the different types of connectors that you have available to you. And there's actually more than this. This is just a... Uh, small list, there's a list of about 200 that you can find your way to uh, for data source connections. In my case, I'm going to be connecting to OneDrive for Business. And in my OneDrive for Business account, underneath my Power Apps folder, so I'll find my Power Apps folder right here, I have the spreadsheet or the workbook that we created just a moment ago called Vet on the Go. And I can select that workbook, and then it's going to show me any of the Excel tables. So, so again, the data does have to be in an Excel table for it to show up here. 
So here I mentioned earlier, if you didn't rename the table, it would show up as table one. You can see that here. So I'm gonna go ahead and select table one. It doesn't really matter what it's called for this purpose because my users aren't going to see that. Uh, at least um, they, will, they will actually see this initially, but we're gonna change it here after a few moments. So I'm gonna select table one and then hit connect. All right. Uh, so I, while, while uh, this is loading, what's happening here is it's actually creating an app automatically for me. So it's looking at the data and it's creating a three screen app. One screen that's gonna have a way of browsing all the appointments a second screen that's going to have the ability to view an appointment, so view the details of an appointment, and then a third screen that's going to have the ability to either edit or create or delete an appointment. Uh, so there's a couple things that we'll see here as we, we get into it. Um, I do see a, a question here about whether or not there is a desktop version of the app. This is a question I asked a little bit earlier, or answered a little bit earlier. There's not a, there is a desktop app, but it actually pushes you to the web browser. So there previously was the capability of editing from a desktop application, but they pushed all that to the web browser, uh, which kind of stinks a little bit. So my, the downside of that obviously is when you're on the go, maybe you're on a plane, you can't really edit what you're doing with your apps. The positive of that is they're able to innovate and change and give you new capabilities and power apps a lot quicker. They don't have to develop for uh, the web browser and for the desktop at the same time. They've, they've made it all from the web browser. So there's some positives and some negatives to that. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and hit skip here. That's just a little welcome screen that we have. And I will. I see a lot of good questions in here. I'll make sure to address some of those as we go through. Uh, but as we look at this, this is my first app. So this app, like I said, developed three screens for me. So let's actually hit the play button or the preview button in the top to see what this app looks like. I really haven't done anything yet. We're going to make a lot of changes to this app here in a few moments. But if I hit the preview button, I can see that it's a pretty basic app. Uh, I mentioned that it does kind of say table one here. We can edit that, obviously but I can see the one appointment that I entered in here earlier is showing up here. It created a few other things for us here. We can add appointments, we can go to the details of an appointment by clicking this, or we can search appointments once we have a much larger list. Now, if we want to look at an appointment that already exists, I can click this little arrow here, and this will take me to an appointment that's already been created. This is the one that we created a few moments ago. And from here, I can either delete the appointment or I can edit the appointment. If I click edit appointment, it's gonna take me to the third screen called the edit screen. And from here, I can edit the appointment that we already defined. I can click the submit icon here to either save or update an appointment, or I can click the cancel button to take me back to where I was. Okay, you can also create an appointment from new, a new one here. If I click the new button, it's actually gonna take me to the same screen, the edit screen, where it's gonna allow me to create a new appointment from scratch. So if I wanted to, I can come in here and I can give it another animal type here. Uh, I'm gonna do, in this case, Crystal's favorite animal, which I asked her right before, is a brown bear. Okay, I can say whatever the cost is for, for uh, helping a brown bear here. I'm gonna say it's probably rather expensive to help a brown bear. And then I can give it a date. And by the way, I see some good questions about can you do this, can you do that? I think I'm probably gonna address a bunch of those as I show you how you can customize this app uh, in a few moments. So don't worry, I, I see a, good, a lot of good questions. We will answer those uh, as we get going. All right, so I'm gonna put Crystal in here, who is our webinar host. And Crystal, what do you want the name of the, the brown bear to be? If I don't get you in a few seconds here, I'll go ahead and name it myself. Um, Charlie. Charlie. Like that? Yeah, we'll go with that. Or Charlie, yeah. i.e. We'll, go, we'll do it right. All right, so, <laughs> and then we'll make up some kind of procedure. We'll say, um, goodness, uh, well, a poor, the poor bear had shots. Okay, we had to give it some shots. All right, so if I hit the submit icon on the top right, it's gonna submit this to, in my case, a spreadsheet. So I see some questions, can this be done to a SQL database? Absolutely, you certainly can do it to a database. Uh, you can do it to a SQL database, you can do it to an on-prem SQL database or a cloud Azure SQL DB as well. All right, so I see a couple new records or one new record that shows up here now. So you kind of get the idea of how this interface works a little bit as far as how to interact with the app itself. So my next goal here, what I'd like to do is walk you through how you can really customize this app. And that's really, we'll, we'll spend the rest of our time. So let me close out the preview window here. So I'll close out the preview, okay? And, and by the way, the thing I just uh, hit okay on there is it's letting you know that you can actually preview your apps interactively. So if you wanna preview an app in this screen that we're looking at right now, all you have to do is hold down the Alt key. And if you hold down the Alt key, you can actually interact with it here just like you could by hitting the preview button. 
I kind of like the, the preview button because it really puts you in the environment of what the app's going to look like. But just note that if you hold down Alt, you can do all sorts of stuff in here like you're, you're testing the app out. Okay. All right, so let's actually get to customizing some of the, some of this stuff. So first thing I want to do is the colors, right? Maybe I'm not a big fan of the colors, or maybe I want to adjust the colors a little bit. And keep in mind that I'm developing this for a mobile application, and I want to try and develop this in a way that's not going to kill people's batteries uh, on their phones. Uh, and one thing that we can do for that is to actually help batteries a little bit is use not as bright colors. Uh, I, I've always, I always kind of heard this, so it's, I'm not sure if it's a myth or not. But if we're telling the, the, the app that we're using to use bright colors, even like white, that's going to eat up more battery than it will if I had darker screens. So one of the things that you can do is you can actually change the colors. I could change the individual background color if I wanted to uh, of the screen itself. So I could go to the background color here by uh, actually I have something selected here. I need to go to the screen itself. But you can go to the properties here and you can actually change the background or you can even change the theme. So up in the top, you'll see there's this a section here where you can apply a theme. And if you change the theme here, you'll see there's several themes that are made available to you. And you can customize it beyond this as well. But let's say, for example, I wanted to choose a darker one to kind of help battery life a little bit. I can select the dark blue one, like so. And you can see it actually adjusts the theme. And you can change it to anything else you want. So you can adjust it to whatever pleases your eye a little bit. Uh, I'm probably going to stick with the dark blue. I like that one but you can kind of change the theme or you can even select the items here and you can change the colors individually. Now, one thing you might notice is once you get so many items on the screen, it can be a little difficult to actually click on them. So one of the big benefits of this tree view on the left hand side is the ability to click on individual items that are on your screen. So this tree view is really helpful for saying, ah, I keep clicking on the wrong thing. Let me go to the left hand side and tell it that I really want to configure this gallery. I'll tell you what a gallery here is in a few moments. But if you use this little tree view on the left hand side, it makes it easier for you to do that. So I can click on something like uh, the rectangle and then tell it that I want to change the color of the rectangle by going underneath the properties in the top left. So you're going to spend a lot of time in this properties menu in the top left to tell it how you want to change the properties of certain items. OK. All right. Cool. So we've got that uh, set. We set our theme. The next thing that I want to do is maybe I want to change the heading title here. Right now it's called table one. That's obviously a terrible name. I should have actually named my table, but because I didn't, I can come in here and modify the name of the header. This is just basically a little text field or text label. And if I want to, I can come in and I can change the name of this obviously to something like uh, appointments. Okay. And maybe I also want to make this a little clear so I can select it and change the color of it to, oh, here's the color of the text. Maybe I make the color of the text white and I can make it bold as well if I wanted to. So these are just a few things that you can do to make things stand out, make it easier to read. And this is uh, all very WYSIWYG capability. So you can go up to the, 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 the formula or not the formula bar, but the uh, ribbon up top and all the same things that you can typically do in something like PowerPoint or Word. You can make a lot of those changes here. It's obviously not to the extent of what Word has, but you do have a lot of those capabilities up in the, the WYSIWYG ribbon editor up on the top. All right. The next thing I want to do is I really want to change the layout of the controls that we see in here. Now, we haven't talked about a lot about what all the different types of controls are. That's something we can certainly get we get much deeper into in our class that we're going to be launching soon. But what I do want to show you is one control in particular that's really important. It's called a gallery control. And you can create new gallery controls by going underneath the insert menu. And here's where you can see all the different controls that are available to you. The one that we're going to be using here in this case is called a gallery. And it's actually already on my screen. Whenever I told it that I wanted to connect and create an app using data, it created a gallery for me automatically here. And basically, you can think of a gallery as a way of displaying a list of values. Okay. So in my case, I want to display a list of appointments. And when I want to go to the details of an appointment, I would click on the little arrow here. And it's already configured all those capabilities here for me. Okay. Now, if I want to modify the way this gallery looks, I can do so by selecting it. So you can either click here within the middle area, the design surface, or again, the tree view is a nice way to be able to make sure you have the right thing selected. So I can select gallery over here where it says browse gallery one, and I can select that. Now, a lot of people actually like the idea of coming through and renaming these items. So the controls that you see on the left-hand side, you're going to reference the names of these controls a lot. So it can be helpful to rename them. It's just very time consuming, and I don't think you want to see me do that today. But renaming these can actually be very helpful later on because you're going to be referencing them. In fact, in the formula bar here, you can see there's a reference to text search box one, which is right here. 
we could rename that if we wanted to to make it a little easier so rather than having the number one in it. All right. Now, if we want to configure and change the way the gallery looks, we can select the gallery and then go over to the properties menu on the right hand side. And then you'll see there's a section here called layout where you can actually configure the layout of the app, the, the gallery that we're looking at. And if we select the hyperlink here, we can configure the way. Here's your data source, by the way. So my data source is coming from OneDrive for Business and Excel table. But you can change the layout, the way that the gallery looks. And here's your options. So you can make it blank if you want. You could display just a title, a title and a subtitle. You could do a uh, an image. So if you wanted to put an image in here, you could do that with title and sub subtitle and uh, body. And then there's some other ones in here as well that you can choose from. I'm actually going to choose this more complex one here, this image, title, and subtitle and body. And you'll see that actually changes the way my gallery looks. It input, inputs an image here for me and it adds a few other properties that we can configure. Now the good news is, is you're not really limited to those layout options. You can actually modify that and you could add other text inputs here if you wanted or text labels if you wanted to. So you have a lot of other things that you can do in here. And you can also change the fields that are being used. So for example, if I went back to layouts one more time and scroll down a little bit, you can see here's the body, the image, the subtitle and the title that I can kind of modify. So for example, maybe I wanna change the title instead of showing the animal type, Maybe I want to show the pet name. And maybe instead of the subtitle, I want to show, you know what, let me come back to that. But let's make this one first name for now. So it's going to be the first name of our customer. And then for the image, we're going to come back to that one. And then for the body, we're going to make that one procedure. Okay, so we're kind of modifying what's showing inside of the gallery. And as we make those changes, you can actually see it show inside the gallery here. Now again, you're not limited to those changes. You can actually select with inside of the cell, uh, the, the, the cards that you have here, you can select with inside of it and go to the formula bar and actually modify them. So here's one thing that's really unique about how galleries work. The way galleries work is you only have to configure the top cell. So you configure the top cell of the gallery and when you do that, you'll notice that it automatically changes the ones below it. So even though I only have this one text field or this text label selected, when I move this one around, it moves around the one below it as well. So that's one thing to keep in mind when it comes to galleries. You have kind of this template cell up top and you modify that template cell and everything below it is modified as well when you change the top one. So what I can do based on that knowledge is I can come up to the top here and when I find my customer name, I can go up to the formula bar and actually make some modifications to this. And I can say that rather than just showing the first name of the customer, I'd also like to show in addition to their first name, this is going to look very similar to Excel. I want to show in addition their last name. And so I'm going to say this dot item, which is just pulling whatever item I have from the gallery. And by the way, there is IntelliSense. So you can see the IntelliSense kind of popping up here as we do it. And when I select that, I can actually tell it, I want to say first and last name combined together. And when I do that, I can see that displayed here properly with inside of my app. Now, one thing I mentioned, remember I mentioned earlier that whenever we were developing our uh, Excel workbook that I recommend that you don't put spaces in the names of your columns. Here's why right here. When you put a space in the name of the column, look at all this garbage that I put in place of that space. So I usually recommend leaving spaces out and then there's actually some ways that you can format it so that you don't, so that you can put spaces into the app without seeing this uh, this is 0020 thing in here. All right, a few other things that I might want to do. Maybe I want to also add in an image. So here's a neat little trick that I have found. This is actually something that I found when I was doing Power BI is a little trick here that you can leverage with images because what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the little image template that I have here and you can see right now what it's pulling in is a sample image. It's just kind of this little sample placeholder. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace that sample and I'm pasting this in from another document I have. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to leverage this little thing to help me because I don't actually have images of the pets. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to pass in the, the, the animal type into Bing and have it return back an image for me. And we should see an image for each of our pets show up when we pass this into Bing. And so what I'm going to do is I have this URL where it says Q equals or query equals. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass into it the name of the pet or the pet, I shouldn't say name of the pet, the pet type. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull in this item again, and I'm concatenating in this item dot animal type. And notice when I do that, we immediately get pictures of our pets. 
And so I can see a picture of uh, my Wyme radar here. I can see a picture of uh, brown bear up here. We're seeing pictures of those little pets show up here. And of course, what we can do, the beauty of Power Apps is it's very phone compatible. So I could have actually taken a picture of those pets with my phone and it have it show up inside of my app immediately. So some really cool capabilities there. It can leverage a lot of our phone settings. All right, the next thing I wanna do is I'm gonna put in here, I wanna to prove to you the fact that you're not limited to what you can do in this gallery control. I can actually add in here another text input if I wanted to, or not a text input, but a text label. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select my browse gallery. I'm gonna go up to label. I'm gonna add in a label and I'm gonna bring that label down here. And I actually just made a mistake that is an easy mistake to make. But the mistake that I made is I added the label to the screen when well, really I want the label to be inside of the gallery. So uh, something that's a little bit complicated to describe right now, but basically you wanna make sure you have an I, the, the card inside of the gallery selected like so. Okay, so you can see that these are actually grouped together and there's a lot of items inside of the gallery. Uh, but what I can do is with the template cell selected here, I can uh, select label again, and now you can see it's actually gonna place that inside of the gallery and it's gonna duplicate that for every cell that I have here or every value that I have. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna replace this first name value with the date, like so. And just like that, I can see the appointment date and time of each of these values showing here. So this is the browse screen. This is just one of the screens that we've shown so far. There's actually a lot more we can do here. Let's actually take this to the next step and say that we wanna to go to our edit screen. Now our edit screen, we can get to a couple different ways. If we want, we can actually go over to the tree view on the left-hand side and we can select the edit screen right here and that'll take us to the edit screen. Or we can actually interact with it from here and that will take us to the edit screen as well, okay? I do see, I saw, I happened to glance over, saw a quick question, is sorting on the gallery possible? It actually is. Sorting is actually already enabled. Right here, you'll see there's a little sort icon. Now the sort icon is driven by this formula up top. There's, it's using something a little bit more complex than what we wanna talk about today, but you certainly can do sorting. This drives the sorting on the gallery and you can see it referencing this variable that's used here uh, called sort descending. And there's, uh, it's basically a bit that says uh, sort true or false, and then you can actually pass in the different values that you want it to sort by. So there's a sort by column property that's used here, and then I can pass in other columns that I wanted to define the sort by if I wanted to. So yes, the short answer is yes, you can certainly do it. Longer answer is you would go into the formula for the gallery, and then you can actually define how you want it to sort. Okay, all right, so we've gotten that taken care of. Oh, this is a really cool thing I wanna show you guys. Let me select that one more time. For those of you that have written DAX in Power BI, you're about to flip out that this is not in Power BI already. Check this out. Look at this little option right here. It's called Format Text. If you click Format Text, notice what happens here for you. It automatically formats this thing to make it actually readable. So there's some nested statements in here. It has an if statement nested in a search, nested in a sort by, and it's really formatted all that for you by clicking this little Format Text option. Really cool. You can remove the formatting if you want to revert it back to what it was but really cool option that's baked into the product. That's fairly new. That came out, uh, I think, a little bit less than a month ago. So it's a really cool way to be able to make your formulas you write a lot more uh, legible. All right, cool. So here's our next step. Our next step is we're gonna go to the edit screen. Okay, and on the edit screen, there's a few things we wanna modify in here. First things first, we wanna uh, change the sort order of our fields that we see in here. So what we can do inside of our edit screen is we can just select anything. Doesn't matter what we select. And when we select one of the cards, and basically a card is kind of a, a container for uh, our label and our text input here. Uh, but when we select a card, you'll see over in the properties menu, we can now edit this and I can select edit field on the right hand side. And if you scroll a little bit down, you'll see this is where you can change the sort order of the fields that you're working with. And it's pretty simple to do. All you have to do if you wanna change the sort order of these fields is just drag and drop them where you want them. So I can drag first name up. I can drag last name after that. Uh, let's get the pet name after that. We got animal type there. Let's get procedure after that and then date. And so by moving things around here, you can change the sort order. It makes it a lot easier to do it this way. You can certainly do it on the screen here as well, but it's easier to do it from the data pane here. You can also modify things like um, how many columns of data that you see. So right now we have one, a one column app. You can change this to two columns and notice what happens when I change it to two columns here. It actually makes it where it, it takes up less real estate, but it also takes up less real estate. So it's a little bit difficult to see things like date. And if you do something like that, you can actually have date stretch out beyond just this one field value. So I could have actually selected date and stretch it out if I wanted to. 
and I could have it so that just that one field crosses multiple uh, columns or multiple columns of, of uh, text inputs here while the other ones don't. You can drag things around and move them around if you want. So it's very interactive. Uh, you can also then go underneath and change the layout. So if you don't like it to just have this vertical layout where you see the text in, the label above the text input, you can change this to something like horizontal. And if you change it to horizontal, probably not ideal for this, but it, horizontal is kind of nicer for whenever you're dealing with mobile applications. And if I were to change this, instead of being a two column one to a one column one, it would be a little easier to read. So let me change it to one column here. So this just is another orientation of the layout of the control or the, the, the form that we're looking at here. And when you look at this, it's a lot easier to maybe see, maybe you kind of like this horizontal layout versus the, the vertical layout. The vertical layout, again, was it had the label above the control as opposed to next to it. Now, you can also change the names of these. So you can see first name doesn't have a space in it. I can change all those things. But you might have noticed that anytime I selected one of these items, there's this little lock icon. It's really small. But there's this little lock icon right here that appears whenever I select one of the cards. And basically, that's kind of locking this control in place where you can't really edit it at all. And that's done by on purpose, uh, but you can't. There's, there's various reasons why. I won't dig into it right now. But the, the, the locking capability is something that you can turn off. If you want to unlock an, a, a control so you can actually edit it, you would select the control, go over to the advanced pane on the right-hand side, and select unlock to change properties. So if I select unlock to change properties here, I can now edit that control. I can change the display name so it actually has a space between first and last name here. Oh, I didn't, I did the wrong one. Display name is right here. That one I need to leave alone. And so I can come through each of these and you can see now why I recommended that you uh, don't add spaces to your column names. That's because it's a lot easier just to uh, leave out the space and kind of make it camel case and then come in here and change the label controls here. So I'm gonna go through, unlock each of these. You have to unlock them individually, unfortunately. There's not like one global unlock button that you have available. But after you unlock each one, you can change the way they'd appear. All right, so the rest of those should be fine. So we change the sort order, we change the way that uh, some of these things, these items appear. We can also change and add in some default values. So perhaps maybe we want to actually make the date have a default value of today. Uh, now, those of you that have worked with Excel, are going to be very familiar with this, or even Power BI, you can select the control here. So I'll select the control that I have for the date, and I'm going to, again, unlock it. And I can provide a default value for the date up in the top. So I can say that the default value that I want to appear for the date is today. Just like you have with Excel and with Power BI, you can use a today function to pass in today's date as the default date that appears whenever my users interact with it. You can do the same thing on the time. So I can actually select the default property for my hour. So let's select default. And I can change, you can see there's already a default value in here, but I can adjust this. And rather than using uh, the default value that's provided, I can overwrite this and say that I want the default to leverage now, because now actually has time in it. Today only has date. But I want to leverage the now function, and I want to return back the hour of now, like so. And you can see when I do that, look here. Now 11 o'clock shows up by default. And if I wanted to, I could do the same thing for minute. I could use the now function with minutes, but I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to let somebody actually be able to change the minutes if they want. You can also do things like changing formatting. I'm not necessarily going to change the formatting of the cost here. We'll probably change that, however, on the display screen. So remember, we have three screens. And you can see all three over here on the left-hand side. Let me minimize all these. We have a browse screen for browsing all of our appointments. We have a detail screen for viewing each individual appointment. And then the one that we're looking at right now is an edit screen. This is where we can either edit a appointment or we can create a new appointment. So the last screen that we haven't looked at yet is the detail screen. This is where it just basically lists the values that we have. And again here, just like we did before, we can select the items here, go over to the properties, and we can change the order. So just like we did before, I'll do this pretty quickly. I'm going to change the order of these. I think we had pet name next. Move cost to the bottom. So you can resort these however you want. You can also change the orientation. So you can select and you can change the orientation of these by changing it to vertical from horizontal if you wanted to. I'm going to leave it as vertical. So you have the ability to change that. And then I can also go, go through, and just like we did on the previous example, I can go through and unlock each and then actually change the names if I wanted to. But I think you guys got the idea. 
uh, I will change this one name here by unlocking just the last name property. Okay, so you guys kind of got the idea. You can click on each one of these, then you can unlock them and change the names of the text here to put spaces here where it makes sense and that sort of thing. I don't think you want, need to see me do that again. All right, the other thing that we can do is we can also, maybe we want to see a picture of our pet. So maybe we want to have the capability of seeing our pet with inside of uh, this uh, detail form or detail screen, I should say, it's not a form. And if we want to, we can make space here. I can move this around a little bit and I can add an image control down here on the bottom. So I can tell it that I want to go to the insert menu and insert an image. And I'll bring this down here. And one of the things we could do, if you remember back from our browse screen, what we did in the browse screen, let me go back there for just a moment so you can see it. On our browse screen, if we select the image, so let me actually choose the right one. Inside of our image, notice what we were doing. We were creating a URL and we were passing in the animal name. So there's two ways we can do this. I could either just copy and paste this and bring this into our new screen that we're working on, our detail screen, or what might be even better is I can actually change this to point to my other control. So check this out. Here's one thing you can do. I can tell it that I want to bring back from, uh, let's see, was it image one? There it is. I can tell it that I want to bring back whatever is stored inside the control called image one, which you see right, where's image one? Right here. You can see image one right here. So I'm telling it I want to take whatever is stored in my browse screen and place it inside this detail screen. So all I had to do was type in image one, it pulled what was on my other screen, and it's displaying it here. So really cool capabilities where you can actually reference other controls you have and bring them in here, okay? One last kind of final touches we can do in here. We can do some cool stuff where maybe we, of course, can change the name of this. So I can uh, say this is my appointment details. You can also change the heading of our, I know we're running out of time here. You can change the details or the, the edit screen. So you can actually make this a little bit more dynamic. I'm gonna just copy and paste some code in here to make this a little faster. So I could put in something like an if statement. And we can say that we want to determine based on what the way that this form was interacted with. Oh, I think it doesn't like my, uh, let me undo that. I think it doesn't like my double quotes. Double quotes are kind of a fun thing when you copy them from one screen to another. Let me undo that here for a moment. Because one of the things that you can do is you can actually modify this so you can use an if statement and say, depending on how this form was launched, I want it to interact as a new form or an edit form. So I can just come in here if I wanted to and manually overwrite this and just say uh, add or edit a record. All right, so let's show you what we've done so far. We've done a lot. I'm gonna go ahead and play this from my browse screen. Okay, and I'm gonna add in a few more records. So let's say I'm gonna add in another record for me. And this time I'm gonna add in something like a beagle. Oop, that's not the that's not the pet's name. That's the pet type. So pet name will be uh, Roxy. Procedure will be uh, has a cold. You can see my defaults did come through, and I can just now change the time and then add a cost. So maybe it was $59.99 to evaluate the dog and then hit save. By the way, you, I mentioned you can do formatting on this. You certainly can. There's a uh, formula called text, and using that text formula, you can modify the cost to actually show up with a dollar sign in front of it. So that's pretty easy to do. All right. So it should be, you can see up here, little marching ants. It's loading that into my Power Apps uh, OneDrive for Business file that I have. And I can see now these are the records that have been inserted. So it picked up a new image based on my little formula I had. And now I can even search here. I can use the search capabilities. Maybe I want to see all the appointments that Crystal made. Uh, so I can type in Crystal and see just the one that she had. Or I can type in Devin and I can see the two that I have. Or I can type in by the name of the pet. Oh. Guess spell right though. Uh, you know what? The name of the pet might not be in that search. So you can actually control what the search can do. And that might not be one of the fields that are in there. But I believe the name of the pet was not either. So the way we can modify that is I can go into the control. And I can tell it what I want to search by. So right now, it's only able to search by the animal type, the cost, which is kind of silly, and the first name of the customer. So I can come in here and I can change this to something like pet name if I wanted to. 
And now I can search by the name of the pet in addition to the other items. So let's test that out. So I can search by Roxy now, and there we go. I just get Roxy. So pretty cool capabilities. Uh, I know we're out of time. The last thing I'll mention here is a really cool thing as well. It does have a lot of integration into Office 365. So if you wanted something like maybe your user's name to show up here automatically, that's easy to do. You could even have the, the an image for the user show up. So I can put in something here like an image, and I can tie the image to like the Office 365 profile image if I wanted to. So I can come up here and I can use the user function. And I can say, bring back the user image and check this out. It's going to bring back an image of me. There it is. And that way, whenever somebody logs in, they'll actually see their image pop up in the top corner of this app. And so they know who's logged in. They can kind of dive through and work through the, the app itself. So that's it for this one. Again, I want to highlight here real quickly. Thank you guys for hanging out and hanging with me for a while. Uh, last couple things I want to show and mention, if you weren't here earlier, we do have a couple courses that are coming for Power Apps. We have an Introduction to Power Apps course that's already recorded. We're just editing it. We have an Advanced Power Apps course that's coming. And because you guys have attended this webinar, I have a special offer for you. You can even purchase to not today uh, if you wanted to. And you'll see these new courses appear in your training package uh, later on. So I have this uh, special code is available to the end of uh, to, until next week, not the end of next week, but until August 28th. If you use Power Apps webinar, that will give you $500 off. So you can have our whole package of courses that will include the Power Apps courses we're talking about. Um, we're also going to have a Power Apps workshop coming on in November. It's a $95 workshop, or if you're already a training elite member with us, you get that for free, and you can email uh, me if you'd like at training at Pragmatic Works, or I can direct you to Keith, which many of you probably already know, uh, to get you signed up for the workshop. And then finally, we're also starting a new kind of challenge, a daily challenge in September. Starting in September, we're going to have a app a day, kind of like Apple a day, but an app a day. We're going to be doing daily Power Apps challenges where you can look at this. And we're kind of looking for new ideas. We have about 15 or 20 ideas, but we need some more. So we're looking for some ideas of different kind of apps you'd like to see develop or different challenges you'd like to see solved. And if you email training at pragmaticworks.com, we'd love to get some feedback on things you'd like to see. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this. I saw there's a lot of good questions. Uh, tell you what, I will hang around for another like five minutes. I can't hang around too long, but um, I will answer a few questions here. Will Power Apps be part of the on-demand training if it's not already? Yes, it will be. Uh, so it will be where we've already recorded it. So within the next two weeks, you should see it available. Um, it's a very good course. We're going to then have an advanced one released next month. Uh, a couple other things here. Let's see. Let me go up here to earlier questions. Uh, so one of the questions was around what emails you can use. You do have to have a work or student email address to use and develop Power Apps. Uh, what if the data source? What if the data source is in more than one place, like uh, in OneDrive for Business and SQL Server? You can certainly do that, and those two different data sources can talk to each other. So you can pass in values. You can use things like filter functions to be able to do that. Uh, can you add, we add multiple data sources, so similar question, yes, you can add multiple data sources. I just didn't in my scenario because we only had a short time. Uh, can we develop this through the Power App service? So this is a question from Sam. Uh, you can't develop it from PowerBI.com, Power so if you launch PowerBI.com, you won't see anything related to Power Apps, but there is integration between the two of them. So from Power BI's perspective, there is a, uh, a Power Apps custom visual. So you, it's actually in preview right now, but there's a Power Apps custom visual where you can actually embed apps that you develop in your Power BI reports and dashboard reports, I should say. And the cool thing about that is you can actually type in and add values from this embedded Power App, and then you can see them show up on your Power BI report right away. So there's some cool things you can do there. There's also some integration in Power Apps to Power BI. So there's actually a control here if you go down, you'll see there is a Power BI tile control, which will allow you to embed Power BI dashboard tiles inside of Power Apps. So there's some cool things you can do uh, on, in that regard as well. Uh, let's see, if you connect to a SQL database, can you create a query to connect to uh, specific? Okay, so Drace asked the question around, basically, can you write queries against SQL databases? This is actually one of my bigger frustrations about Power Apps right now, is it's pretty limited to what you can do when you connect to a SQL database. You can connect to SQL tables. Uh, you can connect to SQL, SQL, SQL database views. Um, you can sort of do store procedures. 
So if you want to do store procedures, you actually have to do it through this roundabout way, uh, unfortunately, where you go to you use Microsoft Flow and Microsoft Flow can call a store procedure and then return it back to Power Apps. A little annoying. I wish that was integrated directly inside of Power Apps by itself. You cannot, uh, at least I haven't seen anywhere, where you can just outright write a, a SQL query here. So you'd probably what you'd want to do, Drace, is write a uh, create a SQL table, SQL view, excuse me, create a view, and then connect to that view here. Uh, so there was a question about uh, sorting alphabetically. We talked about that a little bit. And uh, is Power Apps for mobile apps? Is it is Power Apps for mobile apps only, or can you create a web app too? Um, yeah, so, so you, there's one thing to point out here. I really didn't tell you what do you do next. So we created this app. The next step, of course, is that you would save it. And when you go underneath the file menu and hit save, this is a cool part. I, should, I, I can't believe I forgot this. So I would give the app a name. So I would call this my mobile pet, pet vet, and you'd save it. Okay. So short, short answer is you can actually see tablet apps show up on your phone as well. You just the orientation will be horizontal on your phone. Uh, you would then share this app with others. Uh, and then you would also be able to see this from your mobile device. Now, one other thing you can do here is you can actually set the icon of how it would appear on your mobile device. So underneath app settings here, I actually created, I didn't create, I got an icon here that looks kind of like a vet, it's kind of cartoonish. But I have this little Band-Aid looking thing here so you can import your own icons, make it whatever color you want. And then what I can do is actually have this appear on my phone. So you would download the Power Apps mobile app, and then you can launch this, and then you can even pin the Power App to your home screen on your iPhone, for example. And then you can just click on the i. It would look just like this. It would be an icon inside of um, inside on on your uh, phone that looks just like this, and you can launch it, and then it would redirect and launch your Power App. So the cool thing, the, the, what's really cool about that is you don't have to then go get all of your applications that you developed approved through the Apple Store, which is a nightmare. You can actually just launch the Power app that's already been approved and see all your applications you developed there. All right, let me do one more question because we're already after. Uh, so Brian asked the question, can I fire subsequent subsequential processes after a new record is added that does further processing on the new record? You certainly can, Brian. That's, just, that's likely something you would do with Flow. Uh, there's actually two, depending on what you want to do, there might be a simpler way to do it, but you're likely looking at something in Flow. Uh, the, the way this works, so let me kind of show you an idea here of what you could do. Uh, when I go to, let's say, go to my detail screen here, and if I were to click on a button, You'll see in the formula bar here that when I go to click on this button, even if I were to submit or create a new record, it, it has where it's going to launch open this edit form for me. And one of the things that you can do is you can actually chain operations together. So if you notice this little semicolon here, that semicolon uh, allows for whenever someone goes to click on this button, it does two different things. So what it's doing in this case is it's launching my edit form in edit mode, and then it's launching my, and then it's going to navigate to my edit screen. So it's actually doing two different operations. So you can chain multiple operations together with semicolons. Or if you really wanted to make this more of a process flow kind of thing, that's where you would integrate things like Microsoft Flow or Azure Logic Apps together to be able to have kind of a real workflow process where I need to get something approved before I insert this record kind of thing. That's where Microsoft Flow comes into play. All right, cool. We had a lot of good questions. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this. Uh, a quick question here I saw, is it possible to call REST APIs? It certainly is. So I'll grab that last one. That's an easy yes, yes question. Uh, I know we're out of time for today. I'll try and answer some of these via our blog. But uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed it and look forward to our new classes coming out. And uh, you'll likely see a lot more Power Apps uh, webinars from us as well. You guys have a great day. Take care.